So let's work through one example of a linear system. And this is the harmonic oscillator with friction. Or it's a model for the harmonic oscillator with friction. And we're going to get rid of a lot of constants so that we just have a linear ODE of a very particular form with simple coefficients. So the ODE is given by x equals y, sorry, x dot equals y, and y dot equals negative x minus y. And, y, and x is supposed to be interpreted as the position, and you can think of as y as being the velocity. And this is a harmonic oscillator in one dimension. So you have some point here. Let's say this is the origin, x equals 0. And you have a spring. And there's some mass attached to this spring. And it's being pulled. And the oscillation will be going back and forth. But there's friction. So we expect that the oscillations will tend to decrease in amplitude. And then eventually the point will, the mass will tend towards the point 0. But the question is, um, how exactly will it do that? And it actually depends on the coefficient of friction and how strong the friction is. So I should be more precise in saying a harmonic oscillator with a small friction. And when this number here is actually, so here we have a negative 1. And this negative 1 is related to what I mean by small friction. If instead I had a coefficient of uh, at least 2, then this would be a lot of friction. And the actual motion will actually be different. And I leave for you an exercise to analyze that situation. We're going to analyze the situation of a small amount of friction. And let's check to make sure that at least this makes sense. The derivative of x is y, so that makes sense. That's the velocity. And the derivative of the velocity is proportional to the force is pulling me back towards the origin. There's a force given by the um, actual spring that appears in this, that's this term right over here. And then there's the frictional force that appears here. So this is the spring force, and this is the frictional force. So now what we should do is we should diagonalize the system. The matrix A in this problem is given by uh, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 1. And the eigenvalue. Unfortunately, these eigenvalues are not so simple. I didn't choose the simplest of numbers. But they're given by negative 1 half plus or minus square root of 3 over 2 multiplied by i. So i here is the square root of negative 1. So we're going to have two eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues, I'll use shorthand notation. Lambda 1 is going to be the smaller of these two, and lambda 2 is going to be the larger. So this is 1 half minus i root 3 over 2, and this is minus 1 half plus i root 3 over 2. And so the diagonal matrix that we're going to write down, I've put them in this order so that it's lambda 1, lambda 2. The way you diagonalize a matrix depends on the order in which you put these eigenvalues. So you might get a different uh, similarity transformation s than I will. One similarity transformation that works is 1 over i root 3, 1, 1 half, plus i root 3 over 2. And here there's a negative 1, and it's 1 half with a negative sign, i root 3 over 2. So in terms of our um, um, eigenvalues here, we can actually write this as 1 over lambda 1 minus lambda 2, 1, negative lambda 2, negative 1, lambda 1. And I'll occasionally use this form to simplify some calculations. And you can check that S, A, sorry, uh, well, now that I've written it this way, S, A, S equals D. Or in other words, um, A equals S, D, S inverse. So we can write down so the solution of this ODE by just starting off with the initial condition 
let's say our initial condition is x of 0 equals x naught and y of 0 equals y naught. Why not, right? And therefore, the exponential of Ta is S exponential of T times our diagonal matrix, S inverse. And if you work out through all of this, um, through all of these details, what you'll get is the following matrix. And I apologize for this because it's not so pretty. It's e to the minus t over 2 cosine square root of 3 t over 2. And by the way, we expect uh, a matrix with real entries. I mean, we started out with real numbers. And even though we um, had complex eigenvalues, when we solve for the exponential of the matrix, we're always going to get real numbers because there are no i's appearing in the definition of the exponential. So we expect a, um, a real quantity in the end. Plus sine root 3 over 2 t over root 3. And you know what? I'm, I'm not even going to write the other terms because uh, I'm only going to focus on one of them for now. So you get a matrix, and the first term in this matrix looks like this. You have an exponential um, damping, a decrease in the amplitude, and an oscillation term. So let's, for simplicity, um, well, let me, let me at least draw the, uh, the phase portrait of this ODE. This is if I was drawing the vector field, and I looked at the stream plots, the integral curves of this vector field. And if I did that, you would notice that I would get curves that spiral in towards the origin. In this, in this direction. This is what the integral curves look like for this particular vector field. So for example, if I started off with the initial condition x naught equals 1 and y naught equals 0, which corresponds to being in a position, for instance, that's to the right here. This is the x-axis, let's say. And y naught equals 0 means I let go. So I don't kick it. So I let go of this, um, this mass, and then it oscillates. What does the trajectory look like in this case? So in this case, if I started off here, this would correspond to starting off at an initial configuration where I'm just stationary, or rather a fixed point, and with no kicking. So my velocity, which is the vertical axis here, is 0. In that case, I first start to have a negative velocity, which makes sense because I'm moving in this direction. And then my negative velocity is increasing because there's a strong force and it's pulling me back. But I'm also getting closer and closer to the origin. And once I reach the origin, that means I'm going now in towards the left, because I have, this, I have all of this extra velocity, I'm getting, being pushed in this direction. And then there's a force now that's counteracting to the right. As a result, my velocity is going to decrease. And so I'm oscillating back and forth between those two situations, and my amplitude is getting smaller. And that smaller amplitude is depicted by spiraling towards the origin. And if I actually wrote down a plot of what this looks like, at least the position, well, this should be time now. The position as a function of time is exactly this coordinate given these initial conditions. So you can check if I start with this initial condition, then the position is given by this times this, sorry, this times 1 plus this times 0. So it's just this term. So if I plotted this, this is, let's say, 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, then it would look like the following. You start off and it looks like it's going to be doing some oscillatory motion, but then the amplitude suddenly decreases, and then you're going slower back towards the origin, and now you're even having lower amplitude. So you're sort of like, you start off with an oscillatory, that looks like an oscillatory motion, but you're getting slowed down, and your amplitude is decreasing. You're losing, you're losing energy, and then you come back, and it keeps going like this. So this is a plot of x as a function of t, given these initial conditions. So hopefully this gives you a nice illustration of using the exponential of a matrix to easily solve potentially difficult 
problems. And I'm not saying that this particular ODE is difficult to solve. You can still do it by brute force. But when it comes to larger systems and more complicated linear differential equations, solving them by brute force is quite difficult. And it's much, much simpler to find the eigenvalues, diagonalize your matrix if you can. In this situation, we could. And then use the exponential solution to solve the system explicitly. Before, we only looked at general trajectories and what the critical points looked like. And we also even now have a way to uh, find topological invariance of the critical points. But it's also important to know how to actually solve them explicitly using the exponential of a matrix. And this technique works for any ODE that's linear and the matrix A, if you notice the matrix A here, is independent of time. Such systems are called linear autonomous systems. And then the next video, we'll study something very similar, but we'll allow A to be a time-dependent matrix. And in this case, the solution is not so simple.